Welcome to the Prevailing Word Live YouTube channel and our Minister's Crucible Prevailing Word podcast. I'm Pastor Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. Let's get right into today's message. Please open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 23. This is exclusively for preachers and ministers, but those of you that may be in the body of Christ, well, you can listen in on this conversation because the the last major sermon that Jesus preached was in the book of Matthew chapter 23, and he specifically addressed it to the Sanhedrin, meaning the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of the day. And uh, these uh, scriptures uh, really point to the fact that uh, they were hypocrites in their own right. And so if we would learn from this lesson, we would we would avoid the mistakes that the Sanhedrin made and really take a good look at ourselves and begin to see that Jesus was serious about teaching the Sanhedrin what it is to be a leader, but also to reveal in their hearts uh, that they were hypocrites. Beginning in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1, then Jesus spoke to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. This, of course, was a spiritual position because when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt, they had they were instructed by the Lord to make a portable tabernacle. So there was no place for Moses to sit inside the area where the tabernacle sat. And so this was a place of leadership. They were the lawgivers, if you will, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees. And so as uh, time progressed, uh, there was a sect that came about called the Pharisees, which means to separate. And the Pharisees were the spiritual leaders along with the Sadducees uh, during that time. Verse 2 is a very clear reference to a spiritual position, not a physical one. Verse 3, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not, or they say and do not do, and that's hypocritical. That's when you begin to tell people, this is what you do, but they don't do it themselves. And this is the kind of leadership that in some places around the world and particularly in the United States where we do have uh, certain leaders that begin to tell people what to do, but they don't do it themselves. Verse four, for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In other words, they just simply put so many restrictions. Um, Many people would say that is legalism. And uh, there's a difference between legalism and holiness. There's too many people that um, blur the lines, if you will, and try to put and impose upon people uh, certain true biblical uh, examples and true biblical teaching on what we should do and what we should not do. Uh, But we're talking about individuals that are telling believers uh, heavy things, things that they cannot bear themselves. And it's turned into legalism. Uh, There's an old saying that you do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so the Bible does tells us do's and don'ts. And a lot of people don't agree with that. Many, many of them will say, well, uh, the Bible is not do's and don'ts. Well, if you look at the Ten Commandments, you see a lot of do's and don'ts there. If you look in uh, the book of Ephesians, there's a lot of do's and don'ts there. If you look in the book of Colossians, there is a lot of do's and don'ts there. In fact, pretty much from Genesis to Revelation is a book about do's and don'ts. In fact, the first commandment that God gave Adam and Moses was the ultimate commandment. He told Adam this and and, and is filled with do's and don'ts. He said of the trees of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the garden in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat of it. Uh, This is, of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
So there's a lot of do's and don'ts that, uh, unfortunately, what we've done is that we've watered down the commandments and watered down the do's and don'ts to, to the degree that we say, well, it's legalism and uh, there's a, we, don't, we don't have to do do's and don'ts in the Bible. Well, there's plenty of do's and don'ts in the Bible. Well, for instance, you do not drive past a stop sign. Now, if you do, there's always a chance of you killing somebody or seriously injuring somebody. But also, there could be a police officer that you may not have seen that comes behind your car, turn on his lights, and next thing you know, you are in a, a world of trouble. And really, to be caught by a police officer in that episode is the least of your troubles. At least you didn't kill yourself, kill another person, or seriously wounded yourself or injured yourself or injure others. So there's there's do's and don'ts in the Bible and is what we're trying to, uh, what, not trying to, but what we have said. Uh, so verse 5 says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. And I didn't know this until uh, recently that phylacteries is that little box of leather that is uh, on the on the strapped on the heads of the Jews. If you see them walking in the streets, well, within the phylacteries is the certain commandments of the Lord. And, and it is a reminder to them that uh, the, the Lord is, is speaking to them and that the Lord's commandments are paramount. But also, if you really look at it, uh, it could be a signal or a symbol, symbol of God writing their, uh, the commands on their foreheads. And, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that we can glean from phylacteries. But these Jews, these uh, Pharisees and scribes put these things on for one particular reason, to show how religious uh, they are, and, and they do it in front of the people, uh, the large borders of their garments. In other words, they try to wear these exotic garments to draw, to draw attention to themselves. And we see this in the pulpits today. Some preachers come out with, uh, with uh, elaborate robes and uh, $1,000 suits and uh, $2,000 sneakers and all sorts of things to attract attention to themselves. When we shouldn't be attracting the attention to ourselves, what we should be doing is making sure that the, that the Lord is Lord of all and that we humble ourselves. Uh, verse number six says, they love the best places in, in uh, they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues. In other words, again, drawing attention to themselves when we should be humbling ourselves. The Bible says that we are to humble ourselves in the, in the sight of the Lord. And also the Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, they love these places at, at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues. Why? They want to look important. Sometimes you, you may wonder if they have a, a very poor uh, inferiority of themselves and they want to make themselves look big, look larger than they really are in life. Uh, Jesus goes on to say that greetings in the marketplaces, in other words, they love it when somebody calls them by their title. And that's why we should never be caught up in titles because function reveals the title. When you begin to do what exactly what God calls you to do, the doing of that call reveals who you are. And we're all servants of the Most High God. We're delegated authority in the ministry, and we should never try to uh, exalt ourselves with titles such as apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But it's more so uh, the apostles and prophets, pastors, and teachers that exalt themselves with these elaborate titles. So Jesus went on in verse 7, it says, And to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called a rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And you are all brethren. I wish we would just, you know, just call us brothers and sisters. Never mind our titles. Never mind uh, what what we do. The function uh, plays a certain role. But I, and I get it that that well, we should show respect for for those that are in positions of authority, delegated authority, uh, and and all that. But Jesus said, don't let anyone call you rabbi or teacher, for there's one teacher, and that is Christ. Uh, then he, 
he, he ends it in that verse by saying, and you are all brethren. So we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. But in this in this text, brethren, uh, we are all brothers in the Lord. So it doesn't hurt me for you to call me brother Fred or uh, it doesn't hurt me at all. It doesn't reduce me. to. I know what God has called me to do. So I don't let my title uh, be more important than the function. I allow myself to be humble at all times, and I receive uh, 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 just as well as any other individuals. The only thing that God did was call us out of the body to minister to the body, to serve the body, to preach to the body the the, the word of the living God, the Bible. And, and, and when we do this with a humble heart, we don't mind if somebody walks up walks up to us and calls us brother, whatever. Or it doesn't make it shouldn't bother you. So, so we should make some, some changes based on what Jesus said. Besides, Jesus is the head of the church. He is the one that leads and guides. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. He is the good shepherd. And, and so let, let's learn to humble ourselves and not get offended when we're not called by a particular title. There's a lot of apostles and prophets, and there's a lot of young ones out there calling themselves apostles and prophets. And, and, and those individuals don't even have enough wisdom because they haven't been around long enough to tell us anything. And so we, we need to humble ourselves and see that we're just servants and not allow ourselves to be so caught up in title. Power is intoxicating. We can be intoxicated with the title to the degree that you know, people don't realize that we're just individuals that are serving the body of Christ. So let's do what Jesus said, and you are all brethren, myself included. Do not call anyone on earth your father. And that's all in the Catholic Church. The the Catholic Church always called their spiritual leaders father. But here we see Jesus, the head of the church that they claim to follow, be called father. And and so uh, there's a there's a scripture in the book of Malachi chapter four that talks about that the 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 children will return to the fathers and and and, and I I get the fact that in in uh, in leadership that there are individuals that are much older than us that are much more mature than us and we give them the respect uh, that is due and, and and there's nothing wrong with that to the degree but when you turn it into a flattery situation when you want to flatter them with the title then then it, it's obvious that you're trying to uh, puff them up. So let's be careful along those lines. And you may not agree, and that's well, that's well within your good. You you pr- probably prefer that people call you apostle so and so and prophet so and so and what and whatnot. But if we're really following the head of the church, we will not be offended if someone call, walks up to us and call us brother. So Jesus said this, he says, and do not be called teachers for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. In other words, somebody that comes in and they all that great coming in, looking like a a bishop, looking like a prophet, looking like whatever. uh, uh, Well, we ought to be servants. A servant is a slave. We are to help individuals grow and mature in Christ without uh, uh, exalting ourselves above them. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And the Lord gave, gave me this, and it's the, the Holy Spirit really revealed to me what uh, ministry, ministry is about. And, and then he said that uh, humility and humbleness of mind Humility and humbleness of mind. These are very important because you can get puffed up real quick thinking that you're so anointed and so great among the people that you can do no wrong. And then all of a sudden you find yourself doing something that may be well against the scriptures or or making a mistake, which should humble ourselves. Well, that's why Paul gave, that's why God gave Paul rather a, a, a messenger of Satan to buffet him so that way he wouldn't be exalted because of the revelations that he was receiving from the Holy Spirit. He didn't want to lose Paul. And, and so Paul was constantly beaten, constantly harassed, constantly uh, smacked, constantly 
uh, uh, dealt with so that way he would remain humble because God knew that that would be the only thing that would keep Paul humble. And so if we don't have humbleness of mind and if we don't walk in humility, the Lord will bring about humiliation. And that's basically what Jesus is saying in verse 12, that whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Not might be, not perhaps may be humbled, but he said, will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. In other words, you won't make a big show about it. You won't have a a big title over your name. You won't have your name flashing in lights. You won't have a picture behind you. It's not about you, but it's about the Lord. And the Lord will exalt you, but he will exalt you not so that way you can be seen, but you will be exalted so that way he remains the one to be seen. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayers. Have you ever been in a service and a preacher uh, uh, starts a sermon out and, and he's preaching and he's praying a long time? Or, you know, you're at a funeral and he's praying a long time. And when you're at these uh, extravagant uh, 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 social affairs, he's praying a long time and, and he's very vocal with his vocabulary, uh, very, very caught up in his personality, praying a a long time and it can get on people's nerves. Uh, I, I think it was Ian Bounds that said this or, um, or, or one of the great men of God in the past. He said, our private long prayers add blessing to our public short prayers. So uh, if you're one of those long winded prayers uh, in private, well, your short prayers will have impact But if you're out there and you're praying a long time in public, it can get on a lot of people's nerves. And first of all, it gets on God's nerve because it's about pride. You love the platform so much that you're unwilling to give it up. So you're going to pray a long time to sound so spiritually deep, but you're boring. Therefore, you will receive, Jesus said, greater condemnation. And, and that's evident in uh, the book of James chapter 3 and verse 1, where it says teachers will, will be under a stricter judgment. And so if you're there and you're standing before the people, you're going to receive a greater condemnation. Now, remember what Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, uh, that we are not to do our alms before others, but we're not supposed to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Uh, he, he also said, verily, verily, you have your reward. But if you do it in secret, God will reward you openly. Now, I want to go back up to the verse 13, because notice what Jesus said, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. How do they shut up the kingdom of of heaven against men? Uh, Against men that really are looking for an entrance into the kingdom. You won't allow them in because you don't want to tell them the truth. You don't want to give them the absolute truth of how to get into the kingdom. And so you give them your version of the truth and your version of the truth will never get anybody into the kingdom of heaven. But also Jesus said, for you neither go in yourselves because see, if they were really about getting into the kingdom, they would do exactly what God requires for an individual to get into the kingdom. Nor do you allow those who are entering to go in simply by your con- convoluted way of giving them commands that can't get them into the kingdom. And so we see this with the kinds of teachings that are out there in the world today, that they're teaching the commandments of men by their deceptive uh, uh, teachings that doesn't line up with scripture. In other words, they, they teach the word uh, and 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 it's, there's no harmony of scripture. And, and so I like what it says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. These were more noble, noble than those in Thessalonica in that they uh, they they were they received the word and they received the word 
and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. In other words, they didn't take for granted what a preacher was saying. They searched it out themselves. In other words, they put Paul and the rest of them under a microscope. And then you have Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, If I or an angel or any other person come and preach another gospel, let him be accursed. He said it twice, verse 8 and 9, for a reason. He wants people to understand that, hey, don't take my word for it. If we try to preach another gospel then other, than, other than what's been delivered to you, let them be accursed. So you got to be very careful with those kinds of preachers. So be careful of long praying preachers too, because all they're doing is attracting attention to themselves. Verse 15, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Just imagine being called a, a child of hell. And then you go search the whole land for just one proselyte, one individual that is searching for truth, but you turn them into a child of hell. In other words, you've taught them commands that weren't the commandments of the Lord. And next thing you know, they are children of hell. They turn into demons. We see this in the life of Paul. Paul, when the gospel came out, he was raving mad. I mean, they turned Paul into a, a Pharisee that hated Christ, that hated the gospel. And next thing you know, he was getting letters to hail Christians to prison and to put people to death. And, and he wanted to destroy the faith. But the Lord Jesus Christ stopped them on the road to Damascus. Paul was a child of hell, and he recognized that. But thank God Paul had enough sense to recognize that the Lord Jesus wanted him into the into the gospel, into the kingdom, and, and, and Paul got saved, he got baptized, Ananias came in and baptized him, and he was a part of the fellowship, and he was no longer a threat to the body of Christ. He was no longer, ultimately, a son or a child of hell. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Well, the answer is very clear. The temple is much more important than the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. You see how they were changing the commandments of God? They were lowering the stature of these significant places called the temple and the altar to nothing. And they were dedicated for the service of God for all of, of the children of Israel, and they reduced it to nothing. Oh, if you swear by the temple, it's no big deal. Oh, if if you just simply uh, uh, ignore the altar, it's no big deal. No, 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 no. These are big deals to the Lord because they were dedicated to him for his service. Again, verse 18, and whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift, that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. So the gift is more important than the altar. <laughs> that's See, that's just changing the commands of God. They're reducing uh, uh, God's instruments of service, ultimately reducing the stature, of, attempting to reduce the stature of God. Fools and blinds, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who, who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. See how Jesus brought the stature back up. Hey, wait a minute. You're lowering the stature of the temple. You're lowering the stature of the altar. And now you want to lower God's stature? No, this can't be. Verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and ants and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Look, 
do what you want with tithing, do what you want with money, whatever. Uh, but as far as the Bible is concerned, uh, 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 we, we should give generously. Uh, we, we should not give in a stingy way. And, and we should not be cheap with our offerings. That There are times that, that you know, that, that preachers would come and, and when it's offering time, they would have one dollar and put one dollar in the basket. And there was another time that I've seen a preacher come in and he put a hundred dollar bill in the basket. I mean, that was pretty, you know, for the local church that we were in, that was pretty generous. That's a that's a classic example. We, 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 we've we seen where uh, a preachers come in and, and do some elaborate things. But but uh, again, we got to do it in a way that nobody really knows. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Uh, whatever God sees in secret, he will reward openly. What you give is nobody's business. And, and how you give is God's business. And so the combination of the two, our heart and our generosity, when it's done in secret, God sees it in secret and he rewards it openly. Now here, these Pharisees and scribes uh, who are hypocrites uh, were doing one thing without le- with leaving certain other things undone. And here the Lord is combining the two things. For you pay tithe of mint and ants and come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. In other words, somebody comes in and, and, and let's say they do it in secret or they do it out in the open. Does you know uh, they, they, they bless you with a thousand dollars. I've seen it where it's been a plant. An individual started off and next thing you know, you have a long line of, line of people uh, uh, giving these enormous amounts. But then some of them may be giving it out of their pockets. And then again, some of them may be giving it out of the church's pocket that they come from. We were down there in, in Baltimore and, and we were in, in a church. This, this apostle had three churches. And it was just a leadership conference and we thought nothing of it. But, you know, we didn't we already paid one hundred twenty five dollars for the conference. And, and, and so we weren't expecting to uh, pay it uh, uh, to give an offering or anything like that. But somebody stood up and, and, and gave five thousand dollars to the pastor, not to the church, to the pastor. And, 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 and so next thing you know, all these preachers were getting up, giving these enormous amounts of, of five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. And I'm, I'm like saying, wait a minute, this is a setup. And then one pastor said, I'm just going to give twenty five dollars. And, and, and you should have seen the face on this so-called apostle. You should have seen the look on his face. He strained at the gnat, but he was swallowing a camel. And, and, and so all he had was $25. And so me, I gave nothing. I said I paid $125. This is it. That's that's all I'm going to give. And, and, and so if people got upset, you know, why didn't you get up and do that? Was, no, no, no. It's not. I, I don't. I can't witness to the fact that this is God. Never been back to Baltimore since. Because you begin to see how these pastors are setting up places in such a way where it becomes a money scheme, a pyramid scheme, a spiritual pyramid scheme. And, and you rub my back, I rub your back. You give this amount of money, I give that amount of money. And, and, and and it just got all, you know, into my spirit. And I said, I'll never do this again. I'll never go to a leadership conference ever again. Never, never. I would never darken the doorstep of another leadership conference, whether to preach or to receive. It, it, it's just, just too much. Well, you closing the door on that. Yeah, that's right. I'm closing the door on that because the leadership that, that they, the Lord uh, gives people comes from the Bible and comes from the spirit of God. And so you should have seen him. He strained at that gnat, but he was swallowing a camel. Verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. And see, this is very, this is very important because, see, we all want to look good outside, but inside there is nothing but deadness in us. And, and, and this is true in 
a good portion. I can't say I can't give a percentage because I haven't been to 330,000 Protestant churches in the United States to make a, a determination on in terms of a percentage. But you can rest assured that it's a pretty large number of individuals that always want to look good outside, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, verse 26 says, First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. In other words, we spend so much time cleaning up our outside, but we don't look at cleaning up the inside. You see, the Lord wants a clean heart. Remember what David did to uh, Bathsheba's husband? Uh, uh, it was just a tragedy. First, he had committed adult, uh, lust in his heart for Bathsheba, told his um, uh, 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 assistants to go get her. He had sex with her, committed adultery. And then he found out, David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant. And so he tried to hide what, what he did. So he he called Uriah the Hittite. He, Called him and said, "Hey, come home and, and, and let's talk. Let's talk. Talk about the battle and whatnot." So he gave the report, and, and hoping that that Uriah would go down and have sex with his wife, so that way, you know, well, it, he had sex with her, so that's his child. And and that's cold hearted. First, you lusted after his wife. You already had sex with her in your mind. Then you had physical sex with her, and she got pregnant. Then you called the husband down to so that way he could have sex with her, so that way it covers the pregnancy. And then all of a sudden that didn't work. So he stayed a few days and went back to the battle and told, and David told his leaders, eh, send him to the hottest battle and let him do some fighting there. And then all of a sudden, he come, the report comes back that Uriah was dead, uh, a murderer. So not only had lust in his heart, he committed the adultery with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, uh, 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 sent Uriah the Hittite, the Hittite to, the, to the front lines of the hottest battle where you know he wasn't proficient in battle on that level, and he gets killed, an adulterer and a murderer. And so there's a lot of preachers that says, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to finish well like David did. David didn't finish well. Look at the scriptures very closely. He didn't finish well. So you want to go and commit adultery like David did. And, and fortunately, most pastors, thankfully, they didn't kill anybody to cover up their sin. But you know that they've done some things to try to cover it up. They always call it an affair. Or they call it an indiscretion. Be careful of those words that they use instead of calling it what it is. Because those individuals, those individuals are just trying to cover it up. And, and see, that's what happens. We, 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 we sin against God and we offend God, but we try to cover it up as if God isn't going to pay attention or call you out on it. And these are the dead men's bones and uncleanness that operate in all of us. I'm not excluded. Many of you know my testimony that I was watching pornography and, and preaching in the pulpit and solo sex and all that other stuff. And then God had to call me out on, is this what you do to me after all the good I've done for you? So I know what it is about. I, I know what it's about. I, I'm not talking like, you know, well, you're just throwing stones and you, you need to mind your business. No, I've been in that situation. I know what it's like to to be to have a lustful heart and preaching in the pulpit. So I, I was full of dead men's bones and I was full of uncleanness and I was full of self-indulgence and I was full of of of, of extortion. I was doing the same thing. I was for, I was almost forming myself in the, into the same child of hell that they were. But God called me out. Of, he cleansed me from it. I, get, I, I repented. I turned to him and, and he had mercy on me. And, and if it weren't for the mercy of God, and if it weren't for the fact that the Holy Spirit called me out on it, and if I didn't obey the Holy Spirit when he told me, and if I didn't obey the word of God when he told me, I know for a certain fact that I would have ended up in hell if I had closed my eyes for the last time. Verse 28, even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. 
Can you see the pride that was in their hearts? The pride was evident in their hearts. And, and, and see, that's, that, that is the very thing that uh, 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 affected Lucifer. Lucifer had pride in his heart, and he had to be removed, cast down into the earth, and later to be thrown into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall, the book of Proverbs chapter 16 tells us. Verse 31, therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. I've spent time reading uh, most of the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew for a reason. We see the same thing happening after the pandemic, that emerging apostles and prophets back to their old ways. We don't see that God was bringing or, or allowing that time to really expose many men and women of God uh, that are uh, going after strange things, resuming business as usual. And these individuals are no more than a child of hell. And, it, and I encourage you that if you are on this path, you begin to see where you are and take note. Because if you do not take note where you are, certainly you're a child of hell. And certainly you will not escape the condemnation that is coming. This is the Minister's Crucible on the Prevailing Word podcast. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening.